Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. How are you all doing on this Wednesday? Don't forget to spray your hands with sanitizer if you don't have a, a sink in your studio. Um, we are here to talk about how businesses are building resilience during this time, um, and we are taking your questions live on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. So please start sending those questions in. We, we love your questions, and our guests love your questions, so please start sending those in. Um, our guest today is Tony Shu, and if you haven't heard Tony's original episode um, on the How I Built This podcast, it's well worth going back and listening to it. It's such a cool story about how he grew up um, in, in Illinois, and then his, his parents moved to California, and he didn't speak English for the first couple of years of his life. It's an amazing, just an incredible story of, of somebody who built this amazing company, DoorDash. He's a co-founder of DoorDash. Um, it is the largest restaurant delivery service in the world right now. It operates in more than 4,000 cities and towns in the US and Canada. Tony is with me from his home. Tony, welcome. Thanks guys, good to be with you. Um, just describe where you are right now. Well, I'm in San Francisco right now, uh, but our teams, as you mentioned, are, are spread across the world, US, Canada, and Australia. In Australia, yeah. And um, how, how are you holding up, by the way, over these last couple of weeks? I'm doing well. I, I appreciate it. You know, I, I think all things considered, uh, you know, my family is safe um, and, and I find myself just feeling very fortunate. All right. So let's start talking about the business here. Right. Um, we had a whole week where we talked to chefs and restaurateurs about that industry. And that industry was kind of like the canary in the coal mine because they were the first to be hit really, really hard along with the airline industry. Um, what what has that meant for DoorDash? Because on the one hand, I'm assuming, I mean, there's been a surge in in deliveries, right? People are getting Amazon deliveries and Instacart and, you know, Amazon Fresh and all that stuff. I'm assuming there's been a surge in demand, but also a, a drop in options and in restaurants that are able to operate. So tell me, g give me a sense of what's going on. Yeah, I, I, th I think like you said, when this crisis, you know, f first emerged, you know, it, it certainly started as a public health crisis, you know, globally. And and when it came to the United States, uh, it, it very much, you know, we we're still in the middle of that health crisis. And very quickly, it emerged into a, a simultaneous economic crisis. And I think, like you said, a lot of industries, um, you know, have been hit very, very hard. Travel is one, uh, services, I think, is another, and, and local retail uh, is a third and, and, and restaurant owners, you know, I, I think back to when I was a kid, um, you know, as a dishwasher in my mom's restaurant and, and then the, in the three decades I've been observing the restaurant industry, I don't think I've ever, you know, ever seen something like this where business effectively just halted to a, to, to a stop. Um, I, I, I do think though, because of some of the actions that, uh, you know, the, the different governments here in the U S have taken, um, restaurants, you know, some restaurants are actually doing okay. You know, I, I know there's lots of heartbreaking stories where restaurants, you know, ha having to close lots of furloughs and, and those stories are true. Um, at, at, in the meanwhile, um, because governments have allowed restaurants to keep their kitchens open, deliveries have gone up and, and that has, you know, especially after consumers got uh, used to the idea that the shelter in place and, and some of, and some of these other announcements that they would be in place for a while that they right. got used to their old ways of life, which is uh, they still seek that convenience. They still want to support their local business. They recognize maybe they can't always do that walking inside stores. However, they can get delivery. And, and so, yes, that, that is definitely uh, going up and, and some businesses I'm actually, uh, you know, very grateful to say and, and, and humble to be a part of their journey they're actually they're actually doing pretty well they they are um in in this you know time of year for them um just making sure that they can even have enough money to pay things like rent is, is a pretty big deal i would say the vast majority of businesses can actually do that i would say there are even uh you know restaurants who have been doing a lot of off-premise and takeout prior to this pandemic who are actually seeing success you know there, there's a there's a there's a taco truck actually in the San Jose area, um, a Rojos Taqueria. It, it's incredible how you know it, it started as a business where all of its customers were coming in from nearby uh, churches and, and other uh, nearby areas, and 
and it actually started as a cash only um, establishment. Um, even in just six months um, from when they first partnered with DoorDash in, in the fall and then coming into this pandemic, they were able to you know, go online, accept uh, you know, electronic payment and actually build a takeout business that now has allowed them to earn as much sales you know, from a year ago. Wow. Uh, and, and, and so they're actually doing okay. So, I, so uh, it is a very, very difficult time um, but, but delivery and takeout, I think, have now become essential services uh, that have kept a lot of these businesses alive. A, a lot of restaurants, I mean, and we should be clear, I mean, this has been devastating for the restaurant industry. And, and there's some estimates, I think, from the Restaurant Industry Association that like as many as 75 percent of restaurants will not survive this economic crisis. But in terms of like restaurants that are doing OK, you know, because they are able to provide, um, you know, food that can be delivered, like what kinds of restaurants are you finding? I mean, because, you know, a, 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 a restaurant that really, you know, where it's an experience where you go and there's a beautiful plate of food and it, it's all about the presentation and the food and eating it right there on the premises. It's a little hard to kind of replicate that in delivery. I mean, you can replicate, you know, um, a, a box of, you know, a, a plate of pasta with sauce or, you know, or chow mein or something. But, um, what what kind I mean what kinds of restaurants are actually are you finding restaurants that are pivoting right now that are actually saying you know what we just gotta we gotta focus on just getting food out the door and not worry about presentation so much. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I think a, a couple of different thoughts. Um, you, you know, restaurants that were doing that are doing well in, in surviving this pandemic um, were ones that recognized that even prior to to this pandemic. It, it wasn't that, you know, every meal occasion was happening inside their walls. So they were starting to invest or they had already invested in, you know, their, their takeout or their off-premise business. And those businesses are actually doing pretty well and, and, and they're able to pay off their rents. Um, you know, some of them are starting to think about uh, reopening their stores, especially given, you know, some of the progress we've made on the health front. Uh, and you know, the, the second point I would make is you're right. There are businesses that are starting to change how they do business. Uh, ju just thinking about, you know, how do they recreate, like you said, some of the in-store experiences in a digital or in a off-premise kind of way. You know, I think of Sherry's Pies. It's a, it's a, it's a restaurant uh, actually that started in Oregon and it's a 40 plus year old um, franchise operation. And they're they're trying their best to bring uh, some of the positive experiences that they used to offer in in store, like kids eating free on Tuesdays or free mm -hmm. pie Wednesdays, and they're actually replicating that in their digital menus right. and their digital experiences. I see other sometimes Michelin star restaurants changing, um, you know, their menus, which uh, you know used to be exclusively for in store, very high end. Um, kinds of experiences, and they're making now more approachable, accessible family meals that can uh, really serve as both comfort and and as a way for them um, to keep uh, their business up and running during this period of time. Tony, you are, I mean, the reality is that there are a lot of, m most businesses in America are are losing right now because of the the, the economic situation. There are some businesses that are actually doing very well. We had Stuart Butterfield from Slack on last week, and and that is a business that is a quote unquote winner. Zoom is another example. DoorDash is another example. Um, it's sort of weird, right? Because you're seeing this economic crisis play out in real time, but your business is is actually doing well. So I just want to get a sense from you on, on sort of how you kind of internalize that and also what you think your responsibility is as a quote unquote winner in, in this very unusual situation. Yeah, I think our responsibility to to you know serve the community and and, and serve all the audiences that we've been lucky to partner with, uh, you know, that started six and a half years ago when we started this company, and it certainly is happening in a very pronounced effect right now during this pandemic. And to me, I think it means different things. You know, we started this company to empower local economies, and when I think of that, I think of all the audiences that we serve. You know, for for these restaurants, as you mentioned, and for other types of merchants now that we serve. So, so even in addition to restaurants, it's making sure that we can keep their businesses afloat, and that's actually why we invested, you know, a hundred million dollars in reducing 
our commissions, for example, in half so that all of their sales they're getting during this period are twice as profitable. Um, we're investing tens of millions of dollars in marketing for them so that they can you know, get as close as they can to the sales that they once were seeing before this pandemic in the forms of marketing. For drivers, it's making sure that they're safe. Um, defaulting to no contact deliveries, making sure that you know there's a holistic program to protect them. So uh, it starts with prevent prevention. So giving millions of uh, units of PPE in the form of masks, hand sanitizers, and gloves, making sure that um, they can get access to diagnostics. So in the form of telemedicine um, at affordable rates, making sure that heaven forbid if something if any of them were impacted by COVID-19 that they would have financial assistance. Um, we announced a program nationwide, actually recently with um, the Attorney General in Pennsylvania, that, that you know, all dashers, including new ones that have been on the platform for at least 30 days, you know, would get that financial assistance. That if you're a dasher that is a primary um, ch a child caretaker, or uh, that you don't have to make the decision you know, to choose between taking care of your kids and, and leaving home and, 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 and dashing and you know, giving them temporary relief. Um, and, 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 and then, you know, finally for consumers, making sure that we can speed up some of the things that um, maybe we had planned for uh, later years now, mm -hmm. because bring things like essentials, like grocery items or convenience items, these services are no longer, you know, convenient services. Sometimes they really are essential services to some of the most vulnerable populations like the elderly. Um, and, and, and I would say, you know, the final one that we've, you know, elevated and accelerated is really the community, um, giving free deliveries to all healthcare workers nationwide, you know, to the largest mm -hmm. um, hospital systems, hundreds of thousands of health care workers daily, um, making sure that we're partnering uh, with local organizations like the United Way and donating a million pounds of groceries from those who can give food to those who really need them. And and, and then finally, you know, bring meals to, to, to school children who, you know, sadly can't get access to those lunches anymore because schools are closed. And so, you know, I, you know, to me, um, the responsibility has always been there. It's it's just pronounced right now, and 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 you know, from from a company perspective, uh, we take that extremely seriously, and and we're pulling forward a lot of the initiatives that we have planned for later years. Tony, we're getting a lot of questions from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and please keep asking those questions. And I'm going to kind of take um, there are a variety of questions around commissions and and tips and so on. So I'm going to try to consolidate them into into one question. We, we got a question from Brian Schlieff on Facebook um, and another one from Allison Smith on Facebook. So San Francisco, Washington, D.C., those cities have just passed um, ordinances that limit the commission for delivery companies, including Do DoorDash um, and others that, that do what you do. Um, so first of all, um, I mean, what's your response to that? I mean, it, you know, I think a lot of people are sort of saying, well, restaurants should should keep the vast majority of their sales here and, and that delivery services should, shouldn't, you know, take all that money. Um, I mean, do you, do the decisions in San Francisco and Washington DC, are the decisions that you oppose or, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, the, on that? Yeah, I, I, I would break this down into you know what's happening during the pandemic, and and, and I think you know policy moving forward. Um, you know, I, I definitely agree with the intention of you know helping restaurants. It's it, it's why we cut our commissions in half. That was a you know by fifty percent. So that was a hundred million dollar. You cut them in half during the pandemic. Yeah, April. Um, mm -hmm. you know, early April to all the way to the end of May. Uh, we're the only platform to do that and and you know and because i think it is the right thing to do to make sure that restaurants not only get sales um, but that they are as profitable as possible on the flip side and as i think about you know policies moving forward you know let's let's talk about delivery for a second because i think sometimes um we don't think about all of the constituents or all the audiences to make deliveries happen, you know, it, 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 one of the most important audiences is the driver, the worker. And I'm happy to say that right now they're making more money than ever before, $22 an hour on average when they're doing deliveries. Um, and, and when you put that in context, you know, the, there's millions of people, um, un, unprecedented unemployment right now. And, and, and they these kind of 
um, gig jobs that can offer supplemental flexible income are, are really, really important right now. In order to support um, that pay, there's really two um, you know, sources to do that. One is what fees consumers pay, and the other is what fees the restaurants pay. And 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 you know, in order for platforms like DoorDash to work, all of the audience it needs to work for all of the audiences. So when you cap one of the sources that can pay a driver, you know, such as what fees are collected from a restaurant, uh, it just means that. Uh, it's it's got to come from somewhere and, and most likely it's going to come from the consumer which raises prices which lowers sales for restaurants which actually hurts the most vulnerable populations who may be priced out of some of these essential services and actually gives less work to a lot of workers um, especially in this economy who need um, flexible income and so it, it, it's de it's a, it's a it, it's something you know I, I think caps in general these commission limits are bad policy. Mm. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that, you know, there are other ways, you know, such as some of the voluntary actions that we've taken um, that really um, would solve the, the, the good intention that I think are behind a lot of these legislative proposals, but don't come with any of those unintended consequences. And what about tips? I mean, uh, obviously, you mentioned 22 to $25 an hour on average, I'm assuming most of that money is coming from people who are giving tips. So, um, are people being more generous about tips than usual? I would hope they are, but uh, do you have any data that suggests that? It, it, people are more generous. It, it's slightly more generous. I, I am happy to see that. Uh, um, that, that there's that, um, some more percentage of people are tipping, um, but but it's a, it, it's a slight increase overall. And the tips, the entire tip goes to the drivers now, right? Yeah, they've always gone. They, they've always uh, gone to the driver. Um, we're getting questions about how um, I know you consider or most of your drivers, all your drivers are independent contractors. Obviously, there's some states like California that um, want to change that or trying to change that. Um, we don't have time to go into that. But how are you keeping your drivers safe during this time? Yeah, I think, I th you know, a lot of the work to, to keep uh, dashers, the drivers on our platform safe started um, well before actually the pandemic. We were. Um, uh, we, we were lucky to see some of the uh, events and actions that were taking place in other parts of the world. And platform to do that because we want to make sure to minimize the number of touches uh, along the sequence of a delivery. Then we made sure to work with restaurants to offer tamper-proof packaging in a, in a way that would be consistent with health guidelines and health recommendations. Um, uh, and then um, we made sure that drivers can get access to, to, to diagnosis so that they don't have to you know, sit um, and, and, and wonder uh, you know, whether they may be impacted by COVID-19. So we did that in a partnership uh, with Doctor on Demand nationally so that they can get access to affordable telemedicine. And finally, heaven forbid, if any of the dashers were impacted, that there would be financial assistance in the form of sick leave, um, as well as making sure that um, they would get child care uh, coverage. Tony, um, what do you say to people who are skipping tips right now? I mean, I don't want to shame anybody and, and it's it's tough time and people are, are tight you know, right now, times are tough for, for so many people. But, you know, I mean, a, a driver is definitely putting putting their, their life at risk in some some ways, right? I mean, they are going out and they are bringing food to people who need it. Um, I mean, I don't know. What, what do you think about somebody who, who doesn't tip? Well, I, I, I recommend, you know, people to give when they can. And, you know, what I would say is, uh, uh, tips certainly help. Um, on, at, at the same time, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, other ways of giving as well in addition, um, you know, to tips. For example, I was speaking with uh, one, one of the dashers on our platform, Vanessa, from from the Southern California region uh, just a couple weeks ago. And she's, she actually works in media. Um, and, and because of some pay cuts, uh, you know, she, she needed to find other ways to supplement her income. And so, She's been uh, dashing more often uh, in the past few weeks. 
And you know, she would tell me about um, thank you notes that are being drawn out in chalk on the garage driveway or, or mm. through posters in the window. And, and I know I, and I know it's, it's different and independent, again, from, from tips, but I think these small moments of positivity, uh, they go a long way. Um, it, uh, and I see this also in the restaurant community where um, restaurant owners are not just trying to bring positivity uh, in, in the form of, say, donating meals um, uh, to, to those who really need them. Uh, they're, they're doing that also with the dashers. But, but if and when you can, and, and I recognize it's a very hard time for everybody and we're all in this together, if you can give a little, I'd recommend that you do. Um, what are you, this is a question from Carrie Cooper. It's a really interesting question. Um, given that you operate across states, are you seeing huge differences in business depending on the state? Like for example, you know, in New York where the crisis has been, um, you know, quite acute, um, did, did you see just sort of delivery numbers, um, surge in New York compared with California, for example, where the numbers of COVID-19, um, uh, uh, cases is far lower? So m most states took a, a similar shape. Uh, there were certainly a couple of exceptions, but most states took, took a similar shape. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, what announcements were made by state governments or city officials and, and when those announcements were made. So, for instance, um, it, it, what you saw was as, as um, I guess, as it, right after the uh, shelter in place announcements were made in, in, in a city, the first thing that would happen is, you know, consumers would actually go and stockpile on groceries. And I think this is where you may have read about some of the stories of um, stores running out of toilet paper or, or other, um, you know, convenience items and things like this. And, and after about a couple of weeks, that's when you started seeing consumer behavior resume to some of what was happening before the pandemic, which was seeking, you know, convenience and not necessarily cooking every meal. And they would actually start ordering from restaurants again. And most states and cities took that shape. New York um, uh, was a bit of an exception to that in the sense that uh, in the case of New York, uh, as I, I think some of the viewers may know, New York has a lot of people who commute into the city typically um, when all the businesses are open to work during the day and then they may leave uh, after hours as the workday closes because of the shelter in place announcements new york just saw a reduction in the number of people um, th that were there and, and and so the delivery volume there was um, more significantly impacted hmm. and are you i mean are you seeing a surge of, of people who are signing up to work for doordash i mean i'm like I, I mean, is is are they former or or maybe also Uber, Uber and Lyft drivers who are getting fewer rides? Are you seeing, like, give us a sense of how many people you're seeing sign up for to to become dashers? Yeah, the the, the dasher community, has, uh, especially now as we serve five thousand plus cities across three countries, uh, it, it, it's a pretty broad swath um, of of the population. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, you know, in, in, in the case of Vanessa, who I was referring to a dasher here in Southern California, uh, there are folks who are coming from full-time work. So in, in, in media, in retail, um, in, in, in service, in technology, um, to, fo to folks who, uh, you know, the, the majority of the dashers, uh, of, of, of the majority of the, you know, million plus dashers on the DoorDash platform uh, do this uh, for only about three hours a week. So, so most of it is, is, is supplemental. Um, we've seen some of those hours increase a, a bit. We've certainly seen an influx, as you mentioned, um, and that's been across all sectors, especially the sectors that have been hit the hardest. Uh, and, and a lot of it is, is coming from folks who have seen either furloughs or, or, or pay cuts or, or, or temporary reductions in work. Got it. Um, this is a question from, uh, James Worley um, from Facebook, he asks, yeah, if a driver is making roughly $3 per delivery, how is that enough to cover the cost of operating? Like, how, you know, and how are the drivers getting paid? Can you address that, that question from James? Yeah, well, drivers are earning, you know, tw $22, um, you know, dollars plus per hour nationally. Uh, but that includes uh, tips. And that includes tips, yeah. And, 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 it's, and, and it's, it's, it's far more than, um, you know, the, the, the base pay and, and, the, and the pay, you know, by market does, does vary uh, far more, um, uh, sorry, does vary quite a bit. Um, but, but it's more than 
what's suggested. And so um, the drivers are making uh, a substantial amount of money. Um, that's, uh, you know, I think from our calculations, at least $5 per hour higher uh, than what they were making prior to the pandemic. Thanks for that question, James. Um, this is a, one last question from Facebook. This is from Eve Jimenez. She is a DoorDash driver. Um, I think this is a great question, and and I think she can get her answer right here from from you, Tony. She says um, she's she's requested gloves to use. She's been sent gloves, which is great, um, but she got medium and small size gloves. But she has big hands, so she needs mm -hmm. the correct size. What is the best way to get the correct size? Uh, we'll definitely uh, reach out uh, right after this to make sure you get the correct size gloves. Um, gloves we found as well as masks and, and uh, in particular, the, the, those two uh, forms of protective equipment uh, are a bit harder to come by, especially to your point uh, in the form of different sizes and the appropriate sizes. Uh, we will make sure that you get your gloves. Um, and so we will reach out. All right, that's Eve Jimenez and you can find her on Facebook. Tony, before I let you go, um, let's talk about like five years out from now, because this is, we don't even know how big our change, the changes, we, we don't understand the changes that will come from this pause. I mean, they, they will be enormous, right? Because we're in the midst of it. We don't know what the world will look like and how we'll operate and will people go to sports events and will people be nervous to go to huge gatherings for a while? We just don't know. We don't really know if people will go back to restaurants in large numbers for a while. So five, like sort of five years on, right? When you look back at this time period, um, what do you want to do now that will that you can say in five years' time, like we did this right? You know, we really we built resilience, but we also built, um, you know, we did it. We did this in, in in a way that conforms and aligns with our values. Like, what is the thing that you really are are kind of reminding yourself to focus on right now? To, to me, the, 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 this moment um, has really been one that has energized, um, you know, Team DoorDash, you know, and, and I recognize we're amongst uh, a lucky few who get to see our mission, especially now realized almost every single hour of the day um, in a very, very pronounced way. And, you know, for us, it's making sure that we do the right thing to continue being a true partner to cities, making sure that regardless of, you know, how the world is going to evolve and change and adapt to any form of new normal, that we are the best way for, um, you know, these local businesses to be online, to learn how to do business in a world where customers may, may not always walk inside their doors. Um, to, to be there for the workers on the platform and make sure that not only do they have the flexibility that they all, but that they also have the protections that they um, need and deserve to be on the road to make sure that um, we can continue serving um, all of the consumers and bring, you know, you know, all items to them, um, you know, food and other essentials. And finally, making sure that we are a partner to the community because we started DoorDash as a business that can solve real problems, that can take technology, you know, to bring food from those who are, um, you know, very generous in, deliver in donating them to those who, who need them, um, to bring supplies uh, to, to, to children, um, to make sure that healthcare workers are protected. So all of these things um, are things that I look at as not only things that I'm proud the team has done now, but also things that we will continue to do in the future. Awesome. Tony, stand by for a quick sec. Um, a couple of announcements before we let Tony go. Um, if you've been enjoying these live conversations, please take a moment and share your favorites with friends and family. You can find all of these conversations we've been having over the past three weeks. There's some incredible ones, including this one with Tony at facebook.com slash how I built this. You can find it on the NPR YouTube channel. So check those out. Um, all the videos live there. Um, on Friday, we're going to be back here at uh, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific with John Stein, the founder of Betterment. We're going to talk about the financial services industry, about investments, 401ks, et cetera, and what they are doing to deal with the crisis and, and maybe answers to some of your questions about, you know, watching your 401k. Um, and, you know, a lot of us are freaking out about that, right? Um, also, this Friday, this is a personal plug, so I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to be on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Um, I'll be back on the show. I'm so excited. I love him. He's the best. He's so 
amazing and nice and kind. Um, and uh, we'll see what 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 he has in store for that conversation. So that's at 11.35 p.m. Eastern time um, this Friday night. Um, again, you can see all of our conversations uh, at uh, our How I Built This Facebook page um, or at the NPR YouTube channel. If you haven't already listened to it, um, check out our new episode of How I Built This. It came out on Monday with Davis Smith, the, co uh, the founder of Cotopaxi. It's a company that began with a mission and then became an outdoor gear company. It's a super cool story. Um, I wanted to shout out a couple of people watching. We have a little ton of names. I won't get to everybody, but Alexander Stepanovich, Stepanovich in Serbia, Ingrid Kimistat in Norway, Caroline Joyce in Belgium, Robert Hill in West Virginia, Nora Laley Hansen in Glastonbury, Connecticut, James Johnson, Santa Fe, Jane Schaller in Austin, George Herzog in Southern Maryland. Many more. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been, it's just so great to have you. Um, we're going to be doing these, as I say, twice a week, and we're going to have a couple of weeks um, coming up where we're going to have one every single day like we did with Food Week a couple weeks ago. Tony Shu, DoorDash, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to, 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 to see you here and hopefully we can see each other in face-to-face -face one of these days. I hope so. Talk soon, guy. All right.